Hello, and thanks for joining me again. Let's see, this reading will be the reading of the Altar of Freemasonry. Now, this is by a Harvey or William Harvey, J.P., Provincial Grand Master of Forfarshire, uh, from 1934. To 36. Dundee, TM Sparks and Sons, Crosswell Works, 1948, I assume is the printer. Preface I have had many expressions of thanks from brethren throughout the country for my lectures on the second and third degrees, and numerous suggestions have been made to me to prepare a lecture that might be introduced as part of the working of the first degree. This I have now ventured to do. In many ways, the first degree is not excelled by any of the latter ones. It is the foundation of our system, the basis upon which our whole structure is reared. I hope the following pages will be found helpful to brethren in a way of explaining the scope of the degree and illustrating the symbols presented in the tracing board. Signed, William Harvey. The Altar of Freemasonry the enthusiastic Freemason who is genuinely interested in the system of morality which the order exists to inculcate climbs rung after rung of the ladder which leads to knowledge in our mystic circle. Doubtless the brother who, who reaches the summit forgets much that he has learned in the course of his toilsome ascent. But one thing he is ever likely to remember is the altar at which he knelt as an initiate, and upon which, when darkness had been removed from his wandering eyes, he beheld the three great lights of our ancient and honorable fraternity. The altar is the rallying point of Masonic thought. It is the point with the Masonic circle at which all distinctions among men are swept away, and to which every member may stand related in a common endeavor to achieve a splendid equality of virtue, morality, and brotherhood above. Rising from this sacred spot at which by his belief in God and his honor as a man, he has pledged himself to secrecy, fidelity, and obedience. The young mason is privileged to view the lodge as an emblem of the universe, and to note the symbols of the faith of which his own free will and accord he has become a devotee. And the altar itself may first claim his attention. From the earliest days the altar has been invested with peculiarly sacred associations, and in most religions has been regarded as an indispensable requisite of every place of worship. In primitive times it was believed to be the temporary abode of the deity, and if the idea is well founded and the lodge is a simple or symbol of the universe, it is fitting that the altar should occupy a central position since the Supreme Being, whose favor we solicit, and whose love we acknowledge, is the center and source of all creation. The original purpose of an altar was to provide a place where sacrifices could be made. After the erection of the tabernacle, there was added the altar of incense, which is described as square in section, one cubit each way, and two cubits in height, and with projecting horns, and the authorities insist that that is the proper form of a Masonic altar. In the Jewish ritual, the altar had a threefold significance. It was the place where sacrifices were made, where incense was offered, and at its horns certain classes of offenders found sanctuary. In modern Freemasonry, the whole may be moralized as a spot at which the fervent craftsman offers the incense of brotherly love, relief, and truth in on which he lays unruly passions and worldly appetites as a fitting sacrifice to the genius of the order, and under the shadow of which he finds sanctuary from greed and avarice and other lusts that would devour him. The altar is the appropriate resting place of the three great lights of masonry which are the volume of the sacred law the square and the compasses. These are called the furniture of the law of the lodge, and are dedicated respectively to God, to the master, and to the craft.
The initiate is told that the Bible is a gift from God to man to rule and govern his faith, and square is to square his actions, and the compass is to keep him in due bonds with all mankind. Oliver, in his lectures, illustrates the three lights as follows. The Bible, he says, is said to derive from God to man in general, because the Almighty has been pleased to reveal more of his divine will by that holy book than any other means. The compasses being the chief implement used in the construction of all architectural plans and designs are assigned to the Grand Master in particular as emblems of his dignity. He being the chief head and ruler of the craft, the square is given to the whole Masonic body because we are all obligated within it and are consequently bound to act thereon. As we rise from the altar to take our place in the universe symbolized in the lodge, we, as worthy masons, should carry the three great lights with us, letting them be lamps unto our feet in all our later days, treasuring in our hearts the volume of the sacred law, and as the unerring standard to truth, the square as the monitor of mercy and the compasses as a symbol of that circle of temperance in all things by which we should constantly surround ourselves. Passing from the altar and the lights, the initiate may next observe the form of the lodge of which he is now a unit. It is what is popularly, if somewhat inaccurately, described as an oblong square and is situated due east and west. According to Oliver, the form of the lodge ought to be a double cube expressive of the united powers of the darkness and light in the creation, the Tesseract. And because the Ark of the Covenant and the Altar of Incense were both of that figure, Dr. Albert G. Mackey, in his Lexicon of Freemasonry, puts forward the theory that the oblong form has a symbolic allusion to the ancient world. If, he says, we draw lines which shall circum circumscribe just that portion of the world which was known and inhabited at the time of the building of Solomon's Temple. These lines, running a short distance north and south of the Mediterranean Sea and extending from Spain to Asia Minor, will form an oblong square, whose greatest length will be from east to west and whose greatest breadth will be from north to south. This oblong square, he adds, which thus enclosed the whole inhabited part of the globe would represent the form of the lodge to denote the universality of masonry since the world constitutes the lodge a doctrine that has since been taught in the expressing sentence in every clime the mason may find a home and in every land a brother brethren with a larger imagination take even a broader view than Mackey, telling us that the lodge represents the whole universe, being in length from east to west, and in breadth from north to south, and in height even unto heaven itself. And it is just because of this that the roof is frequently decorated to represent the starry firmament, and the emblem of those immortal mansions to which faithful masons hope to at last ascend there to behold the grand master of the universe who reigns forever. To reach the celestial city, that initiate is taught that he must climb a ladder, which rests upon the volume of the sacred law, and of which the principal rungs are faith, hope, and charity, faith in God, hope in immortality, and charity towards all men. The ladder, frequently called Jacob's ladder, because it suggests that which appeared to Jacob in his vision at Bethel, is one of the prominent emblems of the tracing board to which the initiate's attention may be next directed. There is a tradition in that, that in early days the speculative mason, anxious to illustrate his teaching, followed the fashion of his operative brother and chalked the desired design on the floor of the lodge, just as today in rural places we may find a stoneman or stonemason who draws upon the ground the arch for which he is dressing the stones. It is probably on account of this ancient custom that one prominent feature in the movable tracing board of today is what is called the mosaic pavement, 
which represents the floor or carpet of the lodge. The pavement itself is a checkered squares and is a fit emblem of human life with all its lights and shadows, its joys and sorrows, its successes and failures. Today, our feet tread in prosperity. Tomorrow, we totter on the uneven paths of weakness, temptation, and adversity. And therefore, by such a moral emblem as this, we are taught not to boast of anything, but to give heed to our ways and walk with humility and uprightness before God. The pavement is skirted by the indented or the tessellated border, and the whole is bound by a cord of sixty threads which terminate in the tassels pendant from the corners. And the conventional explanation of the indented border is that as the pavement points out to us the diversity of objects which decorate and adorn the whole creation, so the border refers us to the planets which in their various revolutions form a beautiful border or skirt work around the sun, an explanation which I fear is not very satisfactory. A more reasonable interpretation is given of the cord of the sixty strands. These strands, Brother J. G. Gibson tells us, represent the regular number of members that there were, that were won't, see I hate when they screw up the spelling, that there won't be to a, to be in a lodge, or that there is, and the whole. Okay, so represent the regular number of members that are to be in a lodge. And the whole, he adds, was arranged around the borders with a series of lovers' knots, uh, quote unquote, and all meaning that the mystic tie by which each of the members of the lodge and all might be regarded as bound to serve the brotherhood and each member of it. The tassels pendant from the corners are called the guttural, pectoral, manual, and pedal tassels. They allude to the four cardinal points of the lodge, north, south, east, and west, the four cardinal virtues, and the mason who desires a biblical reference says that they also refer to the four rivers of paradise. According to one authority, they point us to four deliberate acts in the first degree. Guttural, the tongue, alludes to the penalty of obligation under which the initiate swore never to divulge the secrets of the order. Pictorial, the breast, which Freemason safely deposits his secrets from a curious world. And the manual, the hand placed on the volume of the sacred law as a testimony of his assent and obligation of a Mason. And the pedal. The feet placed in the form of a square at the northeast part of the lodge to denote a just and upright man and mason. Another authority connects the four most closely with the cardinal virtues and that as follows. Guttural belonging to the throat and as the throat is that avenue of the body which is most employed in the sins of excessive indulgence, it suggests to the mason symbolic instructions in relation to the virtue of temperance the pectoral belonging to the breast, and as the heart has always been considered the seat of fortitude and courage, the word suggests to the mason certain symbolic instructions in relation to the virtue of fortitude. Manual, belonging to the hand, and as in a peculiar manner, masons are reminded by the hand of the necessity of a prudent and careful observance of all their pledges and duties. Therefore, this organ suggests a certain symbolic instructions in relation to the virtue of prudence, and the pedal belong to the feet, and therefore just as a man as he who plants his feet on the solid foundation of right and cannot be moved from that position either by the allurement of flattery or the frowns of arbitrary power, so the word suggests to the mason certain symbolic instructions in relation to the virtue of justice. Uh, yeah, your feet, like a boot on your head. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it, it is a pious or pious bias belief <laughs> indicating balanced charity of mind that the cardinal virtues which are indicated on the tracing board by the tassels were constantly practiced by great majority of our ancient brethren. And whether that be so or not, there cannot be 
any manner of doubt but that the mason of today who seeks to regulate his daily life and conduct by them will not only be a worthy and valued member of society but a faithful brother of our ancient and honorable fraternity still keeping in view that the lodge is a symbol of the universe and that the universe is the temple of the supreme being who we acknowledge as master the student of the tracing board may next be directed to observe the three pillars that are grouped around the altar these great pillars are symbols of the supports of the lodge and the universe and represent wisdom strength and beauty the divine attributes of him whose wisdom is infinite whose strength is omnipotent and whose beauty shines throughout the whole of creation in symmetry and order moralizing upon the pillars and the attributes they symbolize the meditative mason learns that he should strive to acquire wisdom to guide him in all his undertakings of his life supplicate strength to support him in all times of difficulty and cultivate that beauty of holiness which will enable him to adorn the inward man with faith in god and hope of an immortal land where the dreams of our present earth will be realized in fullest measure the other outstanding features of the first teach tracing board are the ashlars and the movable jewels all of which are intimately related to each other in our system of morality the rough ashlar is a symbol of man in his rude and crude and ignorant condition uninfluenced by education or other refining processes but just as the unhewn stone from the quarry is by the industry and skill of the operative brought into due form and rendered suitable for the most elegant building so man by the tender care and wise instruction of those around him is educated refined and made a fit member of civilized society thus improved and living constantly by the square of god's word and compasses of a good conscience man becomes a subject who may be fitly illustrated by that symbol which we call the perfect ashlar in transforming the stone from its rough to its polished state the movable jewels square level and plumb rule are employed and consequently each has its distinct place in masonic allegory the square is a constant reminder to the freemason that he should regulate his action by the masonic rule and line which are laid down in the volume of the sacred law and that he should never forget that just as the stone is tried and proved by the application of the square so by the application of eternal and unchanging principles of morality each action in human life is judged and its value ascertained the level is an emblem of the equality of all men in the sight of the eternal god who will reward or punish us not according as we may have gained or lost the things that belong to this world but according to as we have obeyed or disregarded his divine commands the plumb rule is a symbol of justness and uprightness with life and action and it admonishes, admonishes the freemason to walk with humility before god and ever to have eternity in view the lessons that the faithful and earnest craftsman learned at the altar of freemasonry and from a study of the tracing board must lead him instinctively to recognize that the distinguishing characteristics of the brotherhood are virtue honor and mercy it is said that marcellus the roman consul who contemplated building a temple to virtue and honor but departed from the idea and later erected two structures so placing them that the worshipper who desired to approach the temple of honor could only do so by passing through the temple of virtue the design of the consul is the object lesson to all men that honor cannot be attained except by virtue to make men virtuous is one of the main objects of fraternity Virtue has been described as the highest exercise of reason and honor as the most manly sentiment or impulse of the soul which virtue can inspire. The actions of all good men are related by honor, for the man of honor scorns to do evil. The virtuous and the honorable man is also a man of mercy, that quality which leads or adds luster to the monarch's crown, freshness to the victor's wreath and is chief attribute of the deity on whom the best and wisest of men must rest his hope when the actions of his mortal life are weighed in the eternal balance 
virtue, honor, and mercy crown the hill of the high endeavor which every faithful craftsman seeks to climb. And if he be true to his code and earnest in his toil, then, in the words of the familiar lecture, though these characteristics should be banished from all other societies, they shall still be found in Mason's breast. The lessons which the Freemason learns at the altar would not only be seen reflected in his own life, but should help him to influence the world around. The thought is beautifully expressed in the opening lines of a poem by Mr. McBride, Bard of Levin Street, John number 170. And go forth, and go forth, and be a mason true. Be master of thyself, and thou shalt sway a mightier scepter than the great Caesar knew. The kingdom grander, and born not for a day, but as thyself immortal. I thank you for joining me.